So the moon goes around the Earth at about a kilometre a second. The Earth goes around the Sun at about 30 kilometres a second. And the Sun goes around the centre of the Milky Way at 200 kilometres per second. But that is absolutely piddly in comparison to the speed that the stars go around the centre of this galaxy. They go around at 500 kilometres per second. That's 310 miles a second. At that speed, and I'm in Scotland. This is the reigning champ of spiral galaxies. It does not get any bigger or better than this. So the funny thing about this video is that I had decided to make this video on the fastest rotating spiral galaxy a couple of weeks ago now. I was sent uh, a paper to read over by one of my colleagues and they'd written up some research work that they'd done and they were talking about rotation speeds of galaxies and it just made me think like, what is the fastest a spiral galaxy can rotate? Because I was trying to like compare it to sort of, you know, how big, how small are these? And so I ended up in this little bit of a Wikipedia spiral looking up what is the fastest rotating spiral galaxy and it obviously happened on this one. And then literally the next day, <laughs> astronomy picture of the day was of this galaxy. And I just, I couldn't believe it. It was such a coincidence. I was just like, should I sweep my office for bugs at APOD listening into my conversation somehow? But obviously just a massive coincidence. So its name is UGC12591, named because it is the 12,591st galaxy in the Uppsala General Catalog. It's very uninventive, but we'll get to that. Now, its speed was first measured back in 1986 by Giovanelli, Haynes, Rubin, and Ford. And they might be names you'll recognize if you've watched a couple of other videos on this channel because, you know, they're sort of the big names in galaxy evolution. So they crop up a lot, especially Rubin and Ford. So for some background, Ken Ford developed an advanced type of what we call a spectrometer. This is a device that lets you take the light from an object in space, split it through a prism into its rainbow, you know, Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon style, so that you get all of its component wavelengths. And then a spectrometer actually is able to record how much light at each of those wavelengths or colors you actually have from that object. Ken Ford's new spectrometer gave you a much better resolution. So we're used to hearing the term resolution in terms of images. It means that your pixels get smaller and smaller and you can see finer detail. Same thing for a spectrometer, except it's the difference in wavelengths to the next wavelength you're recording. So instead of making sort of say a point five nanometer jump, you can make a 0.1 nanometer jump and it gets much finer so you can see much more detail in a galaxy. And it means that for a single galaxy, you don't just see, say, the overall redshift of a galaxy. So how much the emission and absorption line features in a galaxy spectra are shifted because the universe is expanding and the galaxy is moving away from us. You can also see the difference between one side of the galaxy and another because, okay, yes, you've got the overall movement of the galaxy away from you because of the expansion of the universe, but some of the galaxy will also then be coming towards you slightly and some of it will be moving away from you as it rotates. And so with that finer detail, you can actually see that in the spectra of the galaxy that you record. So enter stage left Vera Rubin in the 60s and she used Ken Ford's spectrograph to measure what we call a rotation curve of galaxies. To say, pick a point in the galaxy, how fast are the stars going around it? And so then you can plot like distance from galaxy to rotation speed. So the shape they expected for that was the same shape that we see in the solar system. So if you look at the planets in the solar system and you take Mercury, for example, Mercury goes around the sun every 88 days or so whereas Jupiter takes 12 years, right? The further out from the sun you go, the much longer the orbit is. And that's because all of the mass in the solar system is pretty much concentrated in the sun. 99.9% .9 of the mass in the solar system is in the sun. So because all your mass is concentrated in the center, you end up with that shape just by, you know, orbital maths that Newton and Kepler came up with ages ago. So for a galaxy, when you look at it, you see that most of the stars are concentrated in the center rather than on the outskirts. It gets much fainter on the outskirts. If you plot sort of like the concentration of light across the galaxy, you see it falling off. So we assume there are way more stars in the center than there are on the outskirts. So there's much more mass in the center as well. 
So when you take sort of radius in a galaxy and you plot what speed are the stars rotating at, we expected it to be the same shape as for the solar system. But that's not what Vera Rubin and Ken Ford found. They actually found that it was the complete opposite. You had lower speeds in the center and it got higher and higher as you got out towards the outskirts of the galaxy. Now that didn't make sense because, well, all the mass is supposed to be in the center and that suggested all the mass was actually on the outskirts but we don't see any mass there. Essentially, this was one extra piece of evidence that astronomers had at the time for dark matter. I did a previous video on all the evidence we had and how it built up over the decades so that the only option we had to conclude was that it could be dark matter. But that didn't happen for a decade or so after Rubin and Ford's results. So at the time, this was definitely something that was incredibly puzzling. And so Vera Rubin and Ken Ford then really focused a lot of their efforts on studying these galactic rotation curves that went from being something that was sort of like, eh, yeah, I guess we should look at that and make sure that our assumption is correct to something that's like, we can't currently explain it. So this then brings us back to like 1986 and UGC 12591, which I think deserves a better name, right? Because it's the fastest spinning galaxy in the universe that we know of anyway. And so, you know what? I think I'm gonna dub it the Minogue Galaxy because you know what? Like Kylie, it's Anywho, so they could get the speed that the stars were rotating in the galaxy quite well thanks to Ken Ford's new advanced spectrometer device thingy. It's a scientific term. But what they couldn't get very well was the mass of the galaxy. And so what they would tend to do is from the rotation curve estimate how much mass had to be in those areas and then compare it to how much mass they saw in stars. And they estimated that it was anywhere in the region of sort of like three to nine times more mass than we could see, which is a very loose area to try and put how much mass is in the actual galaxy. But with that estimate, they then made this really nice plot of the sort of this maximum speed the galaxy was rotating at to how much mass was sort of interior in the galaxy. And you can see it's right at the top end of this graph. But then this graph massively distracted me while I was preparing this video because I was also like, ooh, what's this galaxy that's way heavier than anything else on this plot? And so again, I fell into a Wikipedia spiral. <laughs> and so this galaxy is UGC 2885, also known as Rubin's galaxy. It's named after Vera Rubin herself. And at the time it was the most massive galaxy known. And somehow I have never seen this galaxy before in my life and it is freaking gorgeous. Like, how have I missed this before? Especially because it's named after Vera Rubin, who is like one of my, you know, astrophysical heroes. I would think I would have seen it, but I haven't. And I wish I'd had like a little vlog camera going at the, the moment that I saw this image for the first time, because my reaction was just one of like, it's beautiful. And now I want to make another Space is Weird video, but on Rubin's galaxy instead of this one. So... I guess that's coming at some point in the future. Of course, it's no longer the most massive galaxy anymore. We know a bigger one. So again, Wikipedia spiral, down to finding the new most massive spiral galaxy that we know, which is ISO HDFS 27, which is the 27th galaxy in the Hubble deep field search for galaxies. So relatively speaking, Minogue's galaxy is quite massive, but nowhere near as massive as ISO HDFS 27 which also needs a better name. You know, if it's the most massive of all the spiral galaxies, you know, we're talking about a big behemoth here, this should have a cool name. So I think I'm all out of ideas, but you guys let me know like in the comments what you think this should be called and uh, I'll pin my favorite. So Rubin's galaxy was superseded by something more massive than it, but Minogue's galaxy is still the fastest rotating galaxy that we know of. So we wanna know how much mass is in there and if that is responsible for the fast rotation speed. So for that, you need to know how much mass is in stars. So, you know, how much light can you see in the galaxy and assuming some sort of distribution of different types of stars, can you then work out a rough mass? 
Then you need to know how much gas mass is in there, because most galaxies you know, have very high gas masses, which they use to make more stars, but sometimes that gas is unusable, and it's very difficult to detect gas, because unless it's sort of been energized by either some star that's forming next to it or the energy from a black hole, you're never actually gonna get any light from that gas, so it's quite difficult. And then also you wanna know how much dark mass is there as well, which you get from sort of the gravitational mass of the galaxy. And you wanna know sort of the ratio between the two. And I was surprised at how long we had to wait from 86 to actually getting this, because the next paper I could find on the archive, the sort of list of all astronomy papers online, was from 2012. And this was when they finally managed to look at this with X-ray data. So you need X-ray data to actually detect the, the hot gas that's unusable for star formation that you're never going to see in sort of the optical from any emission from the gas due to, say, star formation or, you know, black hole energy being given off, whatever it is. So this was done by Dye and collaborators in 2012, and they managed to get an X-ray gas mass, and then they managed to obviously get the mass that's in stars. They had the gravitational mass of the galaxy, which is sort of the total dark plus stars plus gas, and they managed to figure out that about three to four percent of the galaxy is normal matter, and the rest is dark. That is incredibly low for a galaxy. It's three times less than it should have. There's a really well-known correlation between the speed that a galaxy is rotating at and then the amount of normal matter that it has in it, and you can see that it lies well below that correlation. So we know straight away that something is up here in this galaxy. And a uh, side note again, got totally distracted by this little point on this plot as well, that's galaxy NGC 1961. Again, it's amazing looking, and it turns out that it also has a normal matter fraction of about 3 to 4 percent in that galaxy as well. So the fact that both of these are rotating quite fast in terms of the speed that spiral galaxies uh, rotate at, and they have this reduced normal matter fraction, suggests that there could be something going on here. And that correlation that we've measured for maybe lower speed rotating galaxies isn't sort of a straight line all the way up. Maybe it sort of flattens out as you get to a certain speed. Maybe to get to that certain speed, you somehow have to get rid of some of your normal matter to do it and to give you that sort of heightened ratio of dark to normal matter. So the big question obviously is why would that be happening and how would that be happening? <laughs> this guess is just science in a nutshell there. But Dai and collaborators actually looked at this and they suggested that actually the normal matter might still be there and this galaxy might still have the normal ratio, it's just that that normal matter might have been expelled to the outskirts. But you also wouldn't be able to see it because it would be in the form of coal gas with nothing to irradiate it to make it glow so that we could see that it's there. And so it could be that there's a lot of normal matter out where you would typically expect to find all the dark matter as well, and so you would attribute that mass to more dark matter. And that's a nice hypothesis, but you've also got to explain what process could have thrown out that much of the matter to the outskirts. And so Diatel consider this as well. They suggested maybe it could have been because of supernova. So if the galaxy has formed many, many stars, then perhaps those have all in the sort of resulting supernova explosion have thrown out a lot of the gas into the outskirts. But then they worked out how much energy you would need to throw out as much missing matter as there is in this galaxy, and they worked out you would need 50 billion supernova to do that. 50 billion. Now, in a typical galaxy, you have about a supernova a century. So there literally hasn't been enough time for that galaxy to have had 50 billion supernova to do this. The other option is energy output from the region around the supermassive black hole in the center. So there's been a long-standing theory that if you chuck too much matter onto the black hole at once, the pressure around that from that matter get trying to spiral in so fast as it would be eaten by the black hole, builds up and builds up so much so that the black hole then also expels sort of a wind or a jet or some form of outflow, again, that injects a lot of energy back into the system, can pick up a lot of that gas that's in the galaxy and dump it in the outskirts. 
I like to call these things burps of supermassive black holes and it's very relevant in the minute because we literally just had the news of there being this huge big burp in a galaxy cluster about 380 million light years away. If you want to hear more about that, that will be in this month's night sky news that's coming in a couple of weeks. So stay tuned for that because this is literally my favourite news piece of all this month. So very excited to talk about it on this channel. But again, if you do some estimate of how much energy you can get from that process to how much energy it would take to dump that much amount of matter in the outskirts, you fall short again. Now, it could be that it's a combination of the supernova and feeding the black hole, because if you've got enough gas to make lots of stars, then maybe you've thrown enough gas into the region around the black hole as well to cause that sort of, you know, feedback loop process of getting rid of all the matter. But it could be some other process entirely that you or me or Di and collaborators just haven't thought of yet. You know, something maybe that we've never even considered in how a galaxy forms in the first place. Maybe there was some process that stopped the gas all falling in towards the center and clumping under gravity. Maybe there was some process that just kept it all there on the outskirts. Making those stars in the Minogue galaxy spin around the center of the galaxy ever faster and faster and faster. Just like Kylie. click off. Stupid 10 minute limit on a freaking video length. <sighs> I know you're a photo camera, but could you just be a video camera for me for just one day a week? <laughs> so relatively speaking, Minogue's galaxy is quite massive, but nowhere near as massive as the IH, the ISO HD FS 27. So Rubin's galaxy got superseded by something that was way more massive than it, but Minogue's galaxy, okay, NGC 1-2-5-9-1. And then we need to know how much gas mass there is in that galaxy. Hello, Tommy Rumble. Hungry. <laughs> Don't know if that came across on the mic, but I hope it didn't. Uh, spinning around in the fastest way it's cause of my dark matter that i am like this <laughs>